Hi there and good afternoon. I'm Kijo Lee, the Assistant Director of Academic Affairs at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Welcome back to Close Looking at a Distance, where we take seriously the idea that giving deep and sustained attention to works of art can not only impact the way we interpret those artworks, but also expand our understanding of our world. We're going to get started in a moment, but to give guests some time to log in, in the meantime, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A interface to the right of your screen. So while I certainly have ideas and information to share with you about the works we'll discuss today, I cannot emphasize enough how much this program depends on responses from you, the guests, to make it successful. My Happy Place is a Q&A section that's alive with responses to the works and to the questions I'll ask you along the way. It is also a place for any additional comments or questions you might have about the pieces outside of what's being discussed. We may not get to it all today, but your fellow participants can only benefit from your sharing. When responding, you may include your name or remain anonymous. We'll use that Q&A to post links to artworks we show and any other resources that we mention. And finally, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you, so please complete the survey just posted in the chat either now or at some point over the course of the program. Okay. Let's get started. So though the galleries at the CMA are open and we encourage individuals to visit and experience <clears throat> our collection face to face, social distancing remains a reality. So in close looking at a distance, we've tried to take some of that experience of spending time together discussing artworks in person virtual. It gives us an opportunity to engage artworks both on view and off and explore their relevance to our contemporary world. And because this is a new program, I'll say a little bit about what close looking is as a practice. Next slide, please, Sean. I offer you a quotation by Mark Nepo. He writes, for to listen is to continually give up all expectation and to give our attention completely and freshly to what is before us, not really knowing what will we, he we will hear or what that will mean. In the practice of our days, to listen is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what you hear. And though Nepo is referring to listening, I would argue that the same applies to looking. So let's break down the term close looking. Close implies both intimacy and care with the artworks under consideration, but also with each other. And looking, like Nepo's idea of listening, is to lean in with a willingness to be changed by what you see. So in this program, as we move from detail to detail and question to question, we pursue meaning through the practice of collective close looking. In last week's desktop dialogue, What Does Democracy Look Like? They discussed how artists represent the democratic process by looking at a work by Jacob Lawrence. Today, we'll spend some time considering why artists select specific printing processes to express their ideas. And as we consider each, we'll discuss how the form of the work or how it's made contributes to our interpretation. So we begin with a different artwork made by Jacob Lawrence that you see on your screen now. It's a screen print on the topic of the African-American vote, which is still hotly contested and feverishly defended today. And it's entitled The 1920s, The Migrants Cast Their Ballots, and it's from 1974. Lawrence said about this particular work, and I quote, among the many advantages the migrants found in the North was the freedom to vote. In my print, migrants are re represented exercising that freedom, end quote. So I want you to take a moment to register what you see when you look at this print, and we'll get to its form, but I want to talk about its content or the elements that make up the image and its composition or how those elements are arranged. As I'm describing the image, I invite each of you to put some things that you see or questions you have in the Q&A. And if another participant posts something that you agree with or want to discuss further, feel free to like that comment as it will help us guide our looking. So between 1915 and 1920, Thousands of African-Americans migrated to northern states to escape segregationist Jim Crow laws of the South and to find economic security. In this scene, most likely set in Harlem, 
Voters representing a cross section of the population socialize or read while they wait their turn. The eight color palette includes brown, red, blue, white, yellow, a kind of olive ochre color, gray and black. An array of figures populates this space in, in, in various groupings. In the foreground, we see uh, a, a group of figures that seem to be standing in a line, beginning with, um, in the lower right-hand corner, a figure in what appears to be a bright blue dress holding an ochre colored or olive colored purse. We then see a figure in black, followed by a figure in red, followed by a figure in blue overalls. And then on the uh, right-hand side of the composition, balancing that figure in blue on the left is another seated figure in an olive colored dress, uh, succeeded by a figure in a blue uh, jacket and yellow pants that lead, and both of those arcs lead us toward the middle ground where we see a woman holding, a woman in a red dress holding a baby. We see um, a figure in a yellow cap and we see a figure in a red ensemble with a, uh, a stripe of blue um, around its edges. And as we move further back, we see a table or desk with a grouping of three figures around it with a book open and two of the figures leaning toward indicating and doing something with that book. And in the background, we see the continuation of the line of people that we met in the foreground. In the center of the, of the background, we see a rectangular shaped space with a figure in blue who's reaching upward. And to the right of that little rectangular box, we see a two figures sitting on a bench together. What have you seen? I'm going to take a look at your comments to see what you've seen. Great, wonderful. So thank you, AC. Um, I see that uh, uh, who said that they're really into the colors. Um, and has asked why did the artist use the same color for the skin tone of the floor and thinking about how the colors produce a great visual interest and make it more dynamic. So AC is queuing into the, um, the content of this, the coloring that, uh, that Lawrence has used to um, delineate uh, each figure, but is noticing that uh, the figures um, uh, skin tone, and maybe we can draw in particularly on the figure that's in the uh, sort of foreground that has a yellow cap on that's really close to the floor. Perfect, Sean, thank you. Uh, why their skin tone might appear the same as the floor beneath them. And I invite you to think about why that might be. Um, as I said, this is a screen print that uh, requires, that is uh, made up of eight different colors. And maybe we can say a little bit more about screen printing to help us think about why we might use this. And Steph adds that, uh, they're, she's also, that they're also seeing the bright whites that seem to help draw the eye around the composition to which we'll return. But I'll say um, just a, a, a little bit about screen printing. So screen printing involves multiple steps. Um, so it includes cutting an image into a paper or plastic film, thus creating a stencil. And a separate stencil is required for each color. So in this case, eight stencils had to be carefully excised and Lawrence would have had to determine which shape corresponded with which color over the overall composition. And so he chose brown, the same tone of brown for both uh, the figure's faces and that floor. And then each stencil is placed in succession in a frame with silk or Dacron, which is a kind of polyester or some other fine mesh fabric stretched over it. And finally, the uh, appropriate color is pushed through the stencil with a squeegee or a piece of wood with a rubber blade to create an image. So as you can imagine, 
this process is both labor intensive and slow. So he would have had to create a, a, a drawing or a diagram that showed which color would correspond to which bit of each figure. If we move a little bit and zoom very closely into the figure holding a baby, which includes some of that bright white that Steph was uh, noting. Um, uh, we can see again that yes, this white is being used as a highlight around the figure's face and to pick out for both the figure in the yellow cap and the figure with the white um, uh, head wrap to pick out their features. Um, and AC wonders if the reason that the brownness of their skin is the same as the floor is to economize somewhere. So we can imagine that in order to select another shade of brown, it would have, it would have uh, necessitated yet another stencil um, and another layer being uh, uh, added to this to this uh, image. But I think it's also important to note that Jacob Lawrence was invested in a kind of flattened picture plane um, in many of his works. So in some ways, I see this as a gesture toward that flatness, um, uh, maybe even a slightly cubist sensibility that we find in some of his works. Um, and. Uh, this is a great comment from Anonymous, says the images are sort of blending in as minorities often have to do. The only way that these images can distinguish themselves is with their colorful clothing. So this is an important facet. I don't think that we can identify each of these figures. So there isn't a lot of time spent on saying, you know, this is Mason and this is Jennifer. They are figures that are both singular and uh, and every person. Um, and it's really interesting to think about how his selection of this brown pigment and this blending, the way that they can in turn. So I think, um, Sean, let's move over to the gentleman who's in blue on the right hand border of the of the of the work in a blue jacket and perfect. Um, and so thinking about what it means to be African and American in an American context, whether to stand out is to um, risk, uh, is, is a kind of risk, and to blend in for safety, or maybe it is an emblem of a communal being, a communal experience. Um, as we noted, uh, this is specifically depicting um, folks who migrated from south to north, which is a very uh, specific um, kinds of African-American experience. My own family uh, was included in that, in that my uh, grandmother and great aunts on my mother's side all migrated from Halifax County, Virginia to North New Jersey in the 1930s. Um, and so there are two ways we might, or multiple ways we might consider those colors. Um, I'm going to just take a look and this is great. Oh, um, and so when we let, we can draw all the way um, out. I want to talk about how your eye is led around the composition. Um, and so there is this white that we see um, first maybe in the little highlight of the sleeve of the figure in blue on the lower left, which moves up toward, yes, toward that the back of the shirt of the of the figure in the overalls, which leads us around to sort of his features, connects to the features of the figure with the yellow hat, draws us up toward the, the woman with the baby. And if we keep moving, we see that this draws us in a beautiful way from the foreground all the way to the background. And if we can move up to that background, I think that we see at the topmost portion of the composition, and I want to talk about what that box is back there. Um, we see the white in those rectangular uh, um, uh, moments where we have the gentleman who's reaching, yes, in the blue, perfect, with those little drumstick-shaped uh, pieces. Let's draw back. And so 
you can see how this uh, the white has led our eye. So the processes that um, that are maintained in painting, where there where the color and composition is meant to guide our eye around, still exists in in uh, printing. And in fact, though uh, Lawrence is most famous for his sixty one panel painted migration series, he then made a series of prints um, of uh, migration subsequent. So that was in 1941 that the painted series emerged. And these were created in the 1970s. It was a way for him to continue to think about that subject matter at a distance of about 30 years. Um, and take a look at our Thank you so much. This is a very lively comment section. So, um, and Fran has noted that almost all the figures are looking toward the center of the image or away from the edges, sort of leading the eye in a U shape from the top left through the bottom and up the right side. So really noting this kind of U that he's created around that center trio. That's a wonderful uh, um, observation. Thank you, Fran. And now I think that what we can see is uh, there's a lot of intensity of process that's included in the creation of uh, the 1920s, the migrants cast their ballots. And, um, and I want us to hold on to the idea of or, or, or think about why he might have chosen such a labor intensive process to produce this final image. And to help us look at that, I want us to look at a second piece by a different artist named George Gross. So if we could bring up the comparison. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. So now that you've heard the process um, of the Lawrence described, um, I want us to look at this uh, photolithograph. So it's a very different kind of printing, and I'll talk about how it's different in a moment. But I first um, um, want you to just take a look at this work. Uh, and according to Emily Peters, our curator, this is a bit of an outlier in Gros's artistic of or his body of work. So like we did with the Lawrence, I ask you, what do you see? And what do you see that is similar and different from the Lawrence? And while you register what you see in the comments, I'll give a brief uh, visual description. Yes, absolutely anonymous. That's a voting booth in the back and we'll get back to that. <laughs> um, so like the Lawrence, there is an array of figures across the surface of the print representing a cross section of society. So if we start in the uh, lower right hand corner, the figure that's there, with the cap, yes. We can see that um, each of the figures are on their way somewhere. There is a, uh, a motion that is happening. Legs are separated. There's a leaning forward. And I think similarly to how Fran noted that U shape in the, in the Lawrence, if we pull back to the whole composition again, we can see how from that figure in the cap, we sort of move in almost a serpentine fashion up from the fore to the middle and to the background. But what I do notice as well is there is a central figure around which everyone else seems to be arrayed, not unlike that table. So maybe could we put both of them up at the same time, Sean, for a moment? So like that trio and that table in the center, on the gross, we had that singular gentleman in the very, in the center of the composition. Um, could we look at him a bit closer? <laughs> oh yes, so um, GW notes, this is not a friendly group. I would love to know more about why you might say that. I imagine that even if we get a little bit closer to that gentleman who seems to be smoking and walking with his jacket and waistcoat on, 
if we get close to his face, yes, as we look at the, the way that his jawline is shaped, we look at the downward line that forms uh, the corners of his mouth, we look at the way there isn't a hint of a smile here. And I would, um, and that is the case I think for every figure in this, in this depiction, there is more of a grimace than a smile on their face. And someone's asked specifically about uh, one of the female figures in the in the image. So if we shall can move over to the woman who is nearly who is nude. And so some uh, AI asked Al asked if uh, why is why is she naked? And I challenge you because I'm not sure that she's completely naked. Um, uh, if you look uh, toward the uh, lower half of her body, you can see. And my colleague Stephanie noted this was the most gossamer of gossamer garments um, that seems to be uh, around her body. But yes, she is quite nude. Um, I think, uh, oh, also um, someone noted that the figures look more Caucasian. And we'll get to that in a moment. But to think about why the figures are both sort of disgruntled and this figure is nude, well, Gross was a noted misanthrope. He did not really care for people, and he had an, an even dimmer view of women. And so while he is depicting, um, uh, in his depictions, they are um, routinely unflattering. And so I think this might be an indicator of what she may do for a living. Um, it may be an indicator of how he sees women fitting into society. I think that is up for interpretation, but given his uh, position as an artist to society, which I think is markedly different than what we're seeing in the Lawrence, it helps us to see in some ways, um, uh, because I think we can also see that there is, uh, while there's far fewer colors, and France is maybe the world's oldest profession, perhaps. Um, we see far less color, which might be why we think these figures are Caucasian rather than um, rather than black. Um, and we also see um, uh, uh, a far more um, far more drawn sensibility of the figures. Maybe if we can move to the gentleman who's leaning against the wall, Sean, and draw in on him, please. So when we think about the different ways that they are mark making in this um, in these two works, perhaps we can consider what, uh, um, how uh, this was created. So this is a photolithograph, and importantly, it's not a lithograph, which is still includes some some labor. This uh, way of printing was really about um, gross disseminating very fast his drawings. So as we can see, so if we could draw into perhaps the two figures who are sitting on the bench in the Lawrence alongside of this. Um, oh, sorry, Sean. We'll leave the gross with the gentleman sitting by the wall and we'll look at the Lawrence where we have the two um, figures who are sitting on the bench. So maybe we can see the difference in how the figures are actually formed. Um, and so because what we're seeing is two different ways of picking out features. They are cutouts that meet together in graphically in the uh, in the Lawrence and they are drawn figures whether and even though they're long dra line drawings and spare, there's an inc um, an incredible amount of greater detail in those figures than there are in the Lawrence. And um, so thinking about, and so I want to take just a moment uh, to think about why each of them would have selected those two very different sorts of, of ways of printing and if whether or not it may affect our interpretations because it's, we often uh, spend a lot of time talking about the sort of content and compositions of works, but not necessarily spending as much time thinking about how they were made and how that can contribute to its meaning. Um, and so I just want to take a look. Oh, also, I just want to make sure because Julie has mentioned that in the gross work, 
uh, the people are downtrodden except for the person in the center and anonymous. In the Lawrence piece, the central focus is on people who uh, on people who are signing their names, making the focus uh, a deeply personal statement. That's an excellent observation. So the the um, thinking about how anonymity works in these two uh, pieces is incredibly interesting um, in that it allows us to think about yes we can't tell who these two, who the two figures who are writing in the book are but they are making it they are attesting to being here they are claiming their space and in the gross i might argue that this that they are occupying the space but there isn't a kind of ownership. They are arrayed, um, uh, uh, but not necessarily. They're, they're so uh, weightless to me because there's no indication of a floor in the same way as the Lawrence. I can't believe it, but we are actually drawing to a close for the first half of our program, but we will continue this conversation in Zoom. But before we do so, I just want to thank everyone for joining us for this first portion of Close Looking at a Distance or CLAD. I hope you'll stick with us as we continue in Zoom, where more info on uh, 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 book and more info on that in a moment. And for those of you who can't join us, we hope you'll come back for the next CLAD session on Wednesday, September 23rd at noon, when we're going to take a look at a couple of pieces that, um, that break the form of what we think of as leadership. And then next Wednesday, September 16th at noon, you can join Andrew Capetta and curator Seth Pevnik uh, for Images of Leadership, a conversation about ancient sources for depictions of leadership that remain with us today. And tonight at 6 p.m., you can join us for a photographic friendship, a virtual conversation between noted photographer Abe Frandlich and uh, curator Barbara Tannenbaum on Frandlich's uh, artistic relationship with professor, uh, photographer Ilsa Bing. The program is free and to join, please reserve a ticket at cma.org. They're placing a link in the chat as well. And if you would um, like to learn more about different printing processes, there's a link to a great basic overview um, that we'll also put in the chat and we'll put it again when we uh, join Zoom. And if you would like to explore more of the work in our collection, please visit the CMA collection online. And if you decide that you are joining us in the Zoom room, and if we didn't get to your question or comment during the program, or if you have more, you can always go to ArtLens, ask on the CMA website, and someone will get back to you with an answer. So, if you'd like to continue with us in a more informal way, please feel free to click on the Zoom link uh, and, and we will see you there. We want that next 30 minutes to be as interactive as possible. So when you get to Zoom, please leave your camera on if you feel comfortable and you can turn your mics off uh, so that we can um, keep, the, keep the conversation both flowing, but without interrupting each other and hearing background noise. We'll see you there in a moment, but I also want to make sure that I mention that Close Looking at a Distance has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor, um, which supports both uh, um, Close Looking at a Distance and Desktop Dialogues. And I also, as a teaser to that next uh, program, to the, to the Zoom room, we're actually going to bring a third uh, artwork by Elizabeth Catlett into the conversation, so you don't want to miss it. Again, I thank you all for joining us for this first part of uh, Close Looking at a Distance. And we'll see you all in a moment on Zoom. <laughs>